John Morgan, so thank you very much for being here today as you come from New Zealand, University of Canterbury, and a doctor in geography, and in your works uh, you mentioned uh, those uh, memory trees actually to anchor memory in the landscape. I like avenues. The aim of my talk is to give you the context for First World War Memorial Avenues. These avenues were visionary, innovative, community involved, living memorials that brought together local and national understandings of war and loss with the most up-to-date war commemoration concepts. As such, they were the convergence or intersections Sorry. Right up. <laughs> As such, they were the convergence or intersection of war, memory, and tree commemoration. Yeah. To help understand the development of the memorial avenues, I'm going to talk about two historic aspects that enabled the establishment of the avenues. I will then move on to their general development during the war and beyond, then look at the hidden diversity within the avenues, finishing with the dualism they represented and how trees were loved. In this presentation, I'm going to assess these themes from my own perspective as a New Zealand researcher studying international commemorative practices. The core fundamentals of memorial avenues were the democratisation of memory, the individualisation of sacrifice, and in most cases, the naming of the dead. These were not traditional representations. In British war memorials, these concepts only started to emerge 60 years prior to the First World War with the commemoration of the Crimean War. These recognised the role and sacrifice of the common soldier who had previously been anonymous and inv inv invisible. The, they became visible to the reading public of Britain through the work of war correspondents reporting on the woeful conditions faced by the soldiers. Importantly, the common soldiers were seen to exhibit traits of bravery and endurance, previously attributed to the officer ranks and higher. The common soldier emerged as a new military hero worthy of commemoration. This break with the traditional, uh, early tradition of celebrating the victors and victory produced major shifts in responsibility for memorialization of the dead, the form it took, and location. Once a private family function, a range of new groups began organizing memorials, commemorating all the dead or all the dead associated with their groups. As can be seen, from the text, from the plaque in memory of everyone from the guard, um, the brigade of guards. The primary location of the memorials moved from the church to public space and the public gaze, extending the repertoire of acceptable subjects and themes in public spaces. With the change in memory, sorry, with the change in location came the change of form moving from funerary memorials to the latest innovation in statuary and commemorative functions or features. These new innovations set a precedent and provided a platform for all subsequent war memorialization. As this was happening, there was an emergence of plea, pl planting trees for commemorative purposes. In Britain, this was popularised by Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, and the practice soon spread to the British colonies and was also evident in America. 
Multiple local, national and international events and memories were anchored in the landscape by trees, beautifying cities and towns alike. Arbor Day, an American concept initiated in 1872, along with beautifying societies and other similar groups, promoted the planting of trees. Urban design influences drawn on, drawing on Haussmann's renovation of Paris included or incorporated wide streets, parks, avenues and street trees. By 1914, many urban and rural areas had made some progress in beautifying their place. Britain's tree consciousness was heightened further as the woods went to war, commandeered to fulfil an insatiable demand for trees, for munitions crates and props for the coal pits and the trenches. Overall, communities with tree consciousness were more likely to be open to the idea of avenue trees for their war memorial. The avenue was one of a wide range of possible choices for commemoration. In New Zealand in 1919, communities were reminded that when choosing a memorial, it should capture the emotion of the day, perpetuate memory, and act as inspiration for future generations. With choice came arguments. Across the British Empire, America, well, the British Empire in America, there were varying levels of debate over what was considered an appropriate war memorial. Traditional aesthetic monument supporters who looked to the past for inspiration competed with utilitarian advocates who looked to the future to provide for the living. Others argued that a new form of memorial was required. The avenues of living memorials rose as a hybrid form offering both memorial and utility and amenity functions. Where did the idea for the Memorial Avenue come from? It's very difficult to pinpoint this to a single person. There were at least five Memorial Avenues planted in Australia to commemorate the Boer War. This one specifically commemorates the success of the British and Australian troops. As we have heard, Alexander Gillespie, an officer in the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, wrote a letter from France sharing his vision of transporting, transforming no man's land after the war by planting it as a tree-lined avenue from the Vosges to the sea. The letter appears to have been printed in several newspapers of the day. Back in Australia, there were two early examples in South Australia in 1915, then a small promotional piece appeared in a May 1916 edition of the Education Gazette, promoting to schools the idea of planting Memorial Anzac Avenues on Arbor Day in June of that year, using native trees to commemorate the landings of New Zealanders and Australians at Gallipoli. One of the schools taking part was the Bendigo East Primary School who made an initial planting of 16 native trees in their small avenue. Trees were planted at the Victoria High School, Victoria, BC, Canada, on 20th April 1917 for the teachers and students who had died. This was a month before the Ballarat Avenue of Honour idea was presented for consideration. Ballarat, um, seems to be the launching post for many other avenues to be considered. At the same time, British colonial soldiers were writing landscape descriptions in their diaries and letters about the beautiful French countryside and the long tree-lined roads. Here's a brief example. The whole country around here is simply lovely and the fields are just a mass of colour, yellow and blue and white and greens of all shades. The French have assisted nature by planting thousands of trees in all their towns and along sides of roads. There are hundreds of miles of them. The idea of Memorial Avenues definitely spread nationally and internationally after the first planting of the Australian Ballarat Avenue of Honour in June 1917. 
During and after the war, avenues were planted in Australia, Canada, Great Britain, Italy, New Zealand, and America. They offered a range of distinct form and organisational differences. As living memorials, the avenues would grow and change with the seasons, age and die, evolving over the years as the trees changed shape, size and maturity. The trees could be used to acknowledge individualised service and sacrifice within a collective monument. Attributing the trees to an individual soldier brought private memory into public spaces. At a practical level, the avenues were simple to design and implement, affordable and highly visible. Specialised knowledge and skills could be sourced locally and community participation was encouraged. Women were not marginalised, participating in all levels of planning and execution with involvement varying by community. They were able to move beyond the traditional role of providing refreshments and entertainment to engage in planning, sourcing trees, ground preparation and planting through women's groups and committees or volunteer labour. Children also had opportunities to plant and help. At a quick glance, many memorial avenues look similar. However, there was a considerable amount of variety. This resulted from a myriad of local organising committees making numerous decisions on multiple areas of consideration, both practical and ceremonial. I'm going to take you through some of these variations. When were the trees planted? The avenues were either planted during the war or after the end of the war. So as early as 1915, picking up speed in 1918 and planted through to 1930s. For whom the trees were planted generally depended on where they were planted. Well, when they were planted, sorry. Whether to all who enlisted or those who died. Many included nurses, hundreds of which died from military action, such as 10 New Zealand nurses who drowned in 1915 with the sinking of transport ship the Marquette. They died from disease, including the Spanish flu, and from mishap. In general, those avenues planted during the war were to the enlisted. Some avenues were planted with additional trees, anticipating further enlistments, or there were multiple plantings. Who was planting the trees? This can be divided into two groups. Firstly, the community or group undertaking the commemoration, and the second being those members who actually planted the trees. Primarily, groups undertaking the commemoration were municipalities, towns, rural districts, communities and suburbs, educational institutions, churches and hospitals. Community participation in the planting of the trees depended on the purpose of the ceremony, to be that of being to plant the trees or purely as dedication. Trees were planted by relatives and friends. Women as family or unrelated. Children helping family plant trees or planting trees at school. Military personnel and patients and dignitaries. If the trees were planted before the ceremony, they were generally planted by town or city employees or experts. In Albany, Australia, technical difficulties were cited as to why next of kin could not plant the trees. They were planted by appropriately skilled members of the Albany Agricultural Society. In New Zealand, the Omaru Beautifying Society completed planting several weeks prior to the dedication ceremony. The lack of community participation in preparation and planting turned next of kin into observers. 
Where were they planted? This depended on the community or group planting the trees. Therefore, the sites varied. However, all were planted to be highly visible or where they could make the biggest impact. There were three prominent locations planted centrally, in particular suburbs or districts, or in areas of particular significance. Particular significance tended to be the entrance to a town or a driveway to a church or a hospital. At a school, an avenue could be planted along a drive, in the grounds, or along the road in front of the school. In Saskatoon, Canada, trees were planted along the road leading to the Woodlawn, Woodlawn Cemetery. Parks, school grounds, and domains were popular, for example, Central Park in New York and the Soldiers Memorial Park, Greytown, New Zealand. For the allocation of placement within the avenue, there were discernible patterns, enlistment order, alphabetical order, or chosen by ballot. Some had a particular focus at the start of the avenue, being a place of honour, for those who died, followed by those who returned, first men to enlist, or trees for nurses. Naming of the dead varied too. These, the trees were either named or not. Those not named usually had a dedicatory stone listing the names, or they, there were no names associated with the memorial at all. The naming of the dead linked the trees to individual soldiers or nurses. This visually quantified the level of commitment from the community, pointed to the extent of anguish and suffering, identified families who paid a very high price for their son's or daughter's commitment, highlighted the risk of multiple losses as more sons enlisted. As an example, Upper Junction School, Northeast Valley, Dunedin, there were trees planted along the boundary of the playground, representing multiple losses for several families. One family had four sons enlist. One died at Gallipoli, May 1914, or 1915, sorry, aged 22. One at Passchendaele, October 17, aged 26. And a third in Glasgow from disease, February 1919, aged 22. Only one survived the war. In many memorial avenues, it is common to see the names of two brothers. Some avenues were more democratic and inclusive than others in that they may not represent all who enlisted or all who died. This depended on the method of name collection and the method of payment of the avenue. If there were no official lists of names, organising committees relied on the community, that is next of kin, family and friends, for the names. This allowed the next of kin to participate or to opt out as in the case of Omaru. For method of funding, there are several ways in which the avenues are paid for. Central or local government funding, community fundraising, major donations, and subscription. Sometimes there was a combination of methods used. Subscription was a popular method. However, this focused on the next of kin to bear the cost of the tree, the guard, and the plaque despite the memorial being a community memorial. This was an opt-in scheme, meaning that the record of names could be incomplete. At the time of organising and planting, some next of kin may have not wanted a named tree, it may have been too early, or the cost was unaffordable. Signage. The individual plaques and the amount of personal and military information they contained differentiated the memorial avenues from all other forms of war memorial. These ranged from wooden crosses to metal plaques, while the level of information ranged wild widely from the simple marking of the name via an initial and surname of the soldier or nurse through to as much information that could possibly fit on the plaque. 
Here is a plaque from Point Walter Bicton, Australia. It shows name, rank, name, battalion, cause of death, where he died, the date, his age, and who planted the tree. Here are some other examples with varying degrees of information. The more information supplied on a plaque made it easier for the observer to construct an image of the person named and his or her circumstances. At the same time, it was becoming increasingly difficult for people to retain a romanticised, naive image of war and death. What trees did they plant? In Australia and America, there were calls to use native trees or at least to use trees best suited to the area. There was a range of trees used. Popular across most countries were oaks, limes, plains, elms and conifer trees. More specific to America were holly trees. Australian natives were gums and wattles. The planting of native trees in New Zealand was limited. The totara was planted in some areas in the North Island. However, natives were seen to be hard to germinate and difficult to grow. Avenues were planted either in single variety of species in multiple varieties of a species or planted in multiple species. Some distinguished those who returned and those who died with different varieties or species. The tree planted were in a range of sizes between three to 12 feet or one to three and a half meters, giving a very different visual effect. Avenues planted with small trees initially looked like avenues of tree guards. This was where the vision of the community came into play, planting for the future. When it came to symbolism, Janine Hello, 1989, found it difficult to ascertain the extent to which traditional tree symbolism was consciously intended, especially with such a diverse range of trees. A common cultural understanding of trees, of tree symbolism at the time would not need continual reiteration. Newspaper reports on plantings and dedication ceremonies recorded the metaphorical language used by the local officials and visiting dignitaries in describing the trees, such as memory kept fresh and green, men who were once like strong trees, trees as emblems of sacrifice, tree of freedom, and trees as inspiration and reminders. At every ceremony, the trees were charged with the perpetuation of memory of those who had died and to act as prompts for decades, centuries, or even in perpetuity. Other commentators and promoters drew on traditional symbols and at times were more emo used more emotive language, such as an avenue of living trees would symbolise the victory of life over the death, or the trees as a symbol of service, for the life of service of a tree, for, sorry, for the life of a tree is a life of service, even at the end of life is not the end of a tree's service, to the contrary, the end of life opens new fields of service which add immeasurably to our civilization, our culture, and our happiness. The Memorial Avenue, in all its variation, was the antithesis of war, juxtaposing beauty and life with death and sorrow. Within communities that planted memorial avenues, there were competing public and private needs and requirements. With an estimated nine to 10 million soldiers killed on all sides of the war, and one third of these men being married, there would have been millions of families directly affected by these deaths. A very conservative estimate could have been seven to nine million 
families. In Australia, it was established that every Australian citizen was related to or knew someone who died. In New Zealand, this was every family. The impetus to commemorate was driven by the community and the grieving families. However, the community's aim was to appropriately pay tribute to those who had died, and in doing so, highlight the contribution that the community had made. Whereas mourning parents and families wanted to more memorialise their loved ones and multiple sons. They usually had no body to bury, no control over how the public memory of their loved one was framed. The dead were to be remembered for the cause they died for and their role at the time of death, shaped by official language, official memory and war rhetoric. For the mourners, the trees became surrogate burial places and gravestones to remember the private memories of sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, husbands, and fathers. So to summarize, the memorial avenues were a graceful expression of the changes in the representation of war memory that started after the Crimean War. The combination of nature and memorialization built on individual communities' ability to envisage a memorial that, at planting, looked very different to a fully-fledged avenue. The avenues and its trees would speak of service and sacrifice to generations to come. Functioning as public and private memorials, they were tributes and virtual graves constructed around individual military personas with trees as metaphors for the once living men and women, they were sites of reflection and comfort that emphasized democratized memory, individualized sacrifice, and the naming of the dead. I would like to finish with a story. But I'm not gonna get through it in one piece. So excuse me for that. This is a, a small story from the New York Times called Trees That Were Loved. It was an interview that took place in 1925. Location is Bedford Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, where an avenue was planted to the memory of Brooklyn's hero dead. The story was recalled by a man who ran the gas station on the avenue only five yards from the trees. The other night, a young woman kissed one of the maples. He saw the caress in the gleam of the headlights of a customer's car, but insisted he turned away in haste as other people's love affairs were none of his business. He didn't think this was anything particularly strange. He often saw young men reach through the guards, gently pat other maples, and two or three occasions had heard elderly women talk to the trees. As far as he could figure, such people looked on the trees as sweethearts. Brothers, or sons didn't come back. He hadn't expected so many people to do so. Many of those who came to commune with the saplings left gifts. Small silken flags, wreaths, and cut flowers were carefully placed on the top ring of the guards. There were other remembrances placed whose significance were less easily understood. The gasoline man said that he could not help noticing but the girl who kissed the tree walked rapidly away in tears to meet a man who was waiting for her at the corner. Thank you.